So uh, welcome to all of you for our lecture number 11. And as I mentioned a bit earlier, we are going to discuss today uh, the mechanisms and the processes of folding. Uh, we, we saw last time the, the classifications based on the geometry of the folds. And today we'll look at these uh, folding mechanisms and processes, the most important, not all of them. Uh, and as you can see, we'll discuss um, mechanisms such as active folding, passive folding, and something called bending, and then processes such as flexural uh, sleep, flow, and orthogonal flexion. So uh, let me get started with this. Um, <clears throat> if you look at this diagram, you can see in a nutshell uh, what we are talking about. Uh, active folding or bending or, or buckling, sorry. Uh, you see it here. So you see what the, uh, basically what the situation is in terms of the stress that causes uh, buckling. You see it in the case of bending and you see an example in the case of passive folding. Uh, passive folding is not only in shear zones, but it's a good example. Um, and uh, that's why when we started this course, we had to discuss about stress and strain so that we understand these concepts. Uh, because you as geologists, when you go in the field and look at the folds, you have to understand, uh, as in all cases, in structural geology, the geological history. And in our case, uh, the history of the formation. So the idea is by looking at the folds, tr we try to understand what the um, orientation of the stresses was at the time these folds were formed. Now, um, when it comes to the mechanisms, as you can see, uh, already I mentioned, we have something called active folding or buckling. And here is what is important is uh, not only the direction of the uh, maximum stress relative to a layer, let's say, but also the um, existence of a, a viscosity contrast, of a, a competence contrast, yeah? You remember the, uh, when we uh, talked about the competence um, uh, of a layer, we talked about um, the, relative, the relative ease of flow, yeah? Relative to the uh, uh, neighboring layers. So, when we talk about active folding, we must have, mechanically speaking, this, um, this contrast. And let's say an example, like an analog model. Let's say uh, you have a piece of clay, yeah, which is um, soft. And in between, yeah, two layers of clay, you put a layer of rubber. So then you have a competence contrast. And then you can, you would create a, a actively, yeah, you would you would uh, create folding, but we have also the situation of passive folding. And passive folding, you see it almost every day. Um, what happens in the case of passive folding? We don't have an a rheological influence. We don't have a competence um, uh, contrast. Yeah. So what uh, what could be an, an analog? You go to the um, uh, to the store and get uh, and, and buy uh, toothpaste, yeah, crema dental, and it has several colors, like three colors, the Colgate. So when you squeeze it out, you you can see folds being formed, and uh, the re the reason you see them is because the uh, you have various markers of different colors, yeah, you have, uh, but but the substance is the same, so there is no rheological difference. Yeah, so that, that would be an equivalent of passive folding. And bending, you see how the, uh, the forces are applied to cause bending. So let's look at this mechanism in a bit more detail here. Um, we'll start with active folding, or this is also called buckling. And if you remember Gordon Ramsay's classification from last time, we had the classification in terms of three classes of folds, one, two, and three. And class one was uh, also subdivided into A, B, and C. And uh, the classification was based 
on the behavior of these deep isogons, which are these blue lines, which unite, yeah, link points that have the same deep, yeah. So, so the point uh, point here and the point here has the same deep, yeah. These two points have the same deep. These two points the same deep uh, here. If you take the tangent to these to these surfaces, so uh, as you can see, the class one B folds are also called parallel folds, and you can see why the, their thickness is constant. Um, and the active folding leads to the formation of this type of folds, class one B folds. Now, of course, we I idealize things, um, but the idea is that if you look at this image, for instance, um, what you can actually intuitively feel is obviously there was um, there was a um, viscosity contrast between this dike, the the white the white rock is an uplight dike, yeah, um, and uh, the surrounding uh, mass. The surrounding mass is let's see. Um, this was a granite, yeah. So you have a, initially you had these dikes, and through active folding, you you can see these folds. Yeah. Now let's start thinking a bit about how these uh, folds might form. So let's uh, let's look at this uh, at this paragraph here and imagine a rock layer which is isotropic, yeah, and is imagine just. It's perfectly, uh, you, you know, the the surfaces, upper surface and lower surface of this layer, are perfect. Yeah, perfect planes, perfect parallel. Yeah, and you have um, sigma one. Yeah, sigma one. Uh, it's parallel to this layer. Yeah, so it's parallel to this layer, and also this will be um, the axis which will basically shorten most yeah so what happens if you have this ideal layer with with perfect upper and lower surfaces uh you would shorten it you would shorten it without folding yeah so even if you have the viscosity contrast between this layer and the uh, the layers uh, above and below it uh it will just shorten yeah uh, it will uh, grow thicker, but it will shorten without folding. However, the reason folding forms is there is no perfect uh, surface only in our imagination when we uh, idealize the reality. So there are small irregularities yeah, at these interfaces. And these are the locations where the folds start growing. Yeah, They start growing. Um, and here is what I was just saying. So, so you can imagine that initially there is a, a, a certain amount of shortening, yeah, uh, a, a certain uh, amount of shortening without folding. But beyond a certain point, beyond a certain point, the folds, these are the active folds being formed. Yeah. So the idea, what I want you to Remember when we talk about these uh, mechanisms um, of holding, you must have this rheological contrast, yeah, between a layer and the surrounding layers to form these folds. Yeah, so this would be uh, active folding. And here are some other examples. Uh, another example of uh, active folds here, um, and what happens, as I mentioned from the beginning. The folds, yeah, these are what we call class 1B. Now, these ones look like concentric folds, yeah, para parallel folds. Um, but in between, yeah, the soft material in between, yeah, less competent material, it, it gets folded. Now, you are not going to see it here, uh, but if you had markers, the folds uh, would belong to this class, class 3 folds. You see the limbs get thinner, and you can see the limbs getting thinner, and here as well. So um, that's the idea: class one B folds, and in between you have the class three folds. All right. Now uh, another thing 
uh, I'm just giving you the basic of all these things. We don't go into um, the relationships. There are there are um, some uh, mathematical relationships being developed um, to describe this uh, this process, but we are not going into that. I'm giving you uh, at an intuitive level the feel of what happens and what happens. Imagine this competent layer yeah, being folded and as you can see as you can see here now you have the strain ellipses there is a part of the layer that is stretched that is stretched yeah and the inner part that actually um, is shortened yeah so in between there must be somewhere a neutral surface where there is no uh, stretching and no shortening which separates the two domains uh, I think this is quite intuitive. Yeah, you take take uh, <laughs> some uh, piece of rubber and uh, fold it, and you'll you'll see exactly this phenomenon um, with the, its upper part where, the, where it gets folded and the lower part. Yeah, so that's the idea. Um, and um, the basically uh, we will. We will see this at the, at the end again when we discuss about the process, the process of uh, some process of folding. Now, um, uh, people have done experiments, and I think we, when we were kids uh, and we played with uh, soft materials like plasticine, and we like to play with these things. Now, uh, people do all sorts of experiments. Uh, yeah, they want to to see how these various layers behave to understand what happens in nature. And that's what various people did. You see, this is based on the experiments done by uh, some, um, some authors here. So you can see different thicknesses of the competent layer yeah, in a less competent medium. And basically they look at the type uh, at these folds and the uh, wavelengths, as you can see, now you can see the wavelengths in the case of a thin layer and the wavelengths in the case of a thicker layers, a thicker layer. So what happens when you have when you have several competent layers uh, in a, an incompetent medium? Yeah. So if you if you bring two of them together, yeah, if you bring two of them together, for instance, or three of them or something, uh, you can see here that um, they will behave uh, they will behave as if you have one layer from here to here you have one layer uh, as you can see yeah uh, which has a thickness from this thin layer to this thin layer so this is an yes so in this sense we could yes, say yes. that these three layers with which are different yes. mat material but with the same competence has uh, the same density or concentration? No, no, they are not necessarily different material. It can be the same material, but they are, they have different thicknesses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the density uh, can be different of uh, of the competent layers from the uh, surrounding layers. But in general, the range of densities in in uh, in uh, George is not that large. Yeah. So. Density is a physical property that varies the least, <laughs> to say, um, compared to other physical properties. Yeah. So, but the idea is that if you look, if you look at this, what this experiment tries to show you is that um, that when you have individual layers, you might have different wavelengths depending on how thin they are. But if they are close enough, the thin thin layers, yeah. If they are close enough, uh, the whole package behaves as if it is one competent uh, layer. That's what basically this um, experiment shows. Yeah. All right. So um, what else? Here is something interesting uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, again comes from experiments, obviously, but it helps us understand what we see in nature. Um, you can see. For instance, uh, let's say you have thin and thick layers, 
And um, for instance, there is, as I've shown at the beginning, for thicker layers, you can have a, a certain amount of shortening. And uh, for this amount of shortening, a thinner layer would start some at some point uh, folding. Yeah, so that's the idea. This is what B here shows. And then eventually the thick layer would fold and you see how basically the thick layer dictates dictates what happens to the whole package of the thin layer and the thicker layer. They act as a package when the, the thick layer starts folding, which intuitively you can see it also from this one, yeah? Because you can see that actually, if you look at the wavelengths for the really thin layers here and the bigger wavelength of the, of the thicker layer, you see here that the thicker layer actually is basically dictating the wavelength, yeah? So here, there is a, an extra layer of complexity, yeah? Here, the idea is that the thinner layers could start full uh, being folded before the thicker layer. Yeah, the thicker layer uh, sustains a, a certain amount of shortening without folding. Um, it becomes even thicker, yeah. Um, and then the, when the thicker layer starts folding, the whole package, yeah, uh, it behaves as one unit here. And if you remember last time, we discussed about uh, S folds, and Z folds, like these are the Z folds and these are the S folds here, but they are all called parasitic folds, like parasites, because they are on top of a bigger fold, yeah? So the idea is um, that uh, you can also call them um, second order folds, like first order folds and second order folds. So if you go and map uh, in a region, Imagine, depending on, you know, this could be uh, big folds, like uh, really extensive, and you might see only pieces of reality, like outcrops of showing you a fold here. And you say, well, we have a fold, but this fold is on top of a, an, an even bigger fold and so on. So one of the challenges uh, when mapping is to actually understand the whole structure, yeah? So that's why when you see, when you see this type of um asymmetric folds you have to wonder if they are second order folds on top of a, uh, a first order fold for instance yeah so i'm giving you some basic elements so that you can now extrapolate and imagine that you can have many many situations possible like here yeah so we uh, things look very nice uh when we draw them like this and uh, look a bit <laughs> more complex in nature. But this is multi-layer folding, yeah? And you can see that the wavelength actually, we have like a bigger wavelength here, and you see it here, yeah? So, which is dictated by the fact that you have a certain thicker package, including several layers here. Now, when you go and look in detail, you will see uh, like some smaller folds, yeah, some smaller folds in some of the layers, um, which, and you see them here also very nicely, yeah, second order folds uh, on top of these bigger folds. So, so these things do exist in nature, yeah, so that's the idea. Uh, and here is, here is a, a video which you are going to watch uh, when you have a bit of time, it's a short video um simulating yeah a multi-layer folding for instance all right so i think this is it for active folding uh if you have questions gabriel <laughs> um if not uh let's go a bit um, forward uh and talk about passive folding um i this one will not be a, a long class so we are gonna uh finish i think earlier um, so passive folding, as you can see, uh, when you talk about passive folding, we can uh, see folds of uh, falling in this in these categories according according to the Ramsey classification, which you have in the previous class notes. You have that, and also in the textbook. So this would be class one C, and you see that 
the uh, deep isogons, they basically converge towards the inner arc. So this is class one. But in this case, as you can see, it's no one C, it's no longer parallel, like the limbs, yeah, uh, are uh, slightly thinner, yeah, than uh, the hinge zone. And then you, you have something called class two folds, which are also called similar folds. And you see the deep isogons are parallel to the axial, um, axial plane. And um, um, these two arcs, inner and outer have uh, similar uh, have similar shapes and then class three the isogons diverge towards the inner uh, to, towards the inner arc so with passive folding these types yeah these types of folds can be formed um, but here we don't have a rheological contrast they are just like markers if you were to draw uh, you know, in a uh, in a medium where you cannot distinguish, you cannot distinguish uh, layers. You are going to draw a layer, and then that medium is entrained, yeah, into it, and and it's strained. The folds you'd see would be passive folds because there is no contrast between uh, the layer you drew and the surrounding layers. That's the idea. They were, that's why we call them passive folding. We don't have this uh, mechanical um, component of the rheological difference. So um, can they can form, uh, that's why I said in response to any kind of ductile strain. Yeah, but simple shear, simple shear can be an example. Yeah, You have here some, some uh, examples uh, from the textbook. They are a bit abstract. Uh, in my opinion, but I included them because they are suggestive of what of what happens in the case of simple shear. You see uh, uh, what we talk about when we talk about the simple shear and the pure shear. Yeah, um, here. So um, here is an example. Yeah, here is a, an example. Another example, this, this is a shear zone. So inside the shear zone, you see uh, between these two layers, inside the shear zone, this was a deformation sustained inside this region. Yeah, there is no, no difference in terms of the rheology uh, of these layers here. Um, but not only in, in, inside the shear zone, you remember when we discussed about folds, and we, 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 I was showing you the drag, the drag folding, which happens due to the fact that the layers kind of slip down. And in the brittle domain, there is this drag. Yeah. So that those are also passive folds. Yeah. So that's the idea of passive folds. Um, not nothing much to uh, to say about passive folds. Let's go into uh, looking at bending. This is a bit more interesting because now you can look at several geological situations. Yeah, so here you remember we were discussing about uh, uh, forces that act across layers. So they don't act parallel to the layers, they act across layers and uh, this leads to uh, folding, yeah? And you see here some examples and I'm gonna uh, discuss each of them a bit. Uh, the first one uh, is the formation of the budans. Yeah. Uh, now you might say, well, but we have here a competent layer, obviously, because uh, the the formation of the budans uh, forms when this layer is competent and this one is not. I agree, but we are not talking here about the folding of the competent layer. We are if this thing is is uh, stretched, yeah. Uh, we are talking about the fact that you see the uh, incompetent material here uh, is basically being uh, folded inside these regions. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, the result of um, what we call bending. Now, uh, and a very interesting example, and when we will be in the second part of the course and talk about tectonics, we will talk about the formation of Orogens and a component part of the orogens is the fold and thrust belt. Now, the fold and thrust belt 
is the that zone of the origin, which is uh, basically uh, the part of the origin that is uh, from which the foreland starts. So the foreland is the continental interior. So in the case of Bogota and uh, of uh, uh, Colombia, we have the Cordillera Oriental here in Bogota. And beyond the Cordillera Oriental, we have the Janos, yeah? And we are Vicencio and beyond. So that is the foreland. So the foreland to the Andean origin is all this region to the east of the origin. So if you go to, uh, you go south, uh, you have the, um, the foreland uh, part of the uh, An An Andes in Argentina uh, where Mendoza is, yeah, and the wines, the wine region. And then from Mendoza to the, uh, to the Atlantic coast, that is the foreland. So this part of the origin is called the fold and thrust belt because here you have packages of big packages of um, of rocks being thrust and transported on low on low angle folds one on top of the other and this is how basically these mountains are formed so you can imagine one of these thrust sheets which extends here yeah but it's not drawn it encounters a ramp yeah it encounters a ramp so at this scale the whole package of rocks is being bent, yeah? So this is um, basically folding by bending. And I think this is very intuitive and it makes sense to you, yeah? Um, this is what happens. Um, another situation, another situation is uh, imagine the, uh, that you have sedimentary rocks, a sedimentary basin, and the basement to the sedimentary basin has a, a, a block a block topography, yeah? So basically you see there are folds that affect uh, the, the basement. And with the formation of these folds, there is, there is the folding, the forced folding of the layers on top uh, of the basement. Now, of course, if this folding continues, at some point, the fold will propagate here. So you will have a rupture, yeah, a brittle deformation. But before the brittle deformation in terms of uh, folding, you will have this kind of folding. And this is a formation of monoclinal folds. Yeah, so these folds are monoclines, as you can see. And another, finally, another example given in the textbook, and I think these are very good examples to at different scales. Yeah, this can be the scale of an outcrop, and you see this. This is at the scale of a mountain range or at the, of an orogenic belt. Yeah, of course, regional scale. This is at the, at the scale of, you know, when we look at the sedimentary basin. Now, imagine uh, in the same manner, the intrusion, yeah, the intrusion of magma or salt, like the salt being the least dense <laughs> geologic material, um, it will rise up through a process called diapirism and will form diapirs of, uh, the, the, the will, of salt will be formed. So it can be salt or it can be magma. And if it is intruded into these sedimentary layers, you can see how it would bend them. Yeah, of course, it will it would fold them and break them if they uh, if the uh, intrusion continues. Um, so these are true geological examples. Now, uh, of course, we 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 look at these diagrams because some of them we cannot even take photographs. Like, of course, we could take there are images if you look out of such uh, um, situations uh, in the textbooks um, and when we will discuss about the fold and thrust belts I'll, I'll show you images of this so um, that that can be illustrated but I think now we are uh, talking about the uh, understanding the mechanics here all right 
So we discussed about this mechanism that I want you to, to keep in mind, active folding, passive uh, folding and uh, bending. And then finally, this is the final part of the class today. Uh, I wanted to give you uh, a bit of a break and again, not force too many things um, to you because I would be more than happy if you assimilate the concepts that we discuss in this in this class. So um, there we, we look at here at the models, uh, kinematic models of folding, yeah. Um, and here are kinematic models that produce that class one B of parallel fold. So the the thickness stays the same, yeah. Um, this is something that you know. Probably you all as kids you played around uh, taking a book and <laughs> bending it or taking some sheets of paper and bending them, yeah? And seeing what happens. Now, what happens, let's say you, you have a pile of sheets, yeah? Uh, a pile of sheets and you bend it. You, if you have, uh, you know, a pile of sheets in the printer, you can take it out and bend it now and see what happens. What happens is that the sheets will slip one relative to the other to accommodate this bending. And we call this flexural slip. Uh, imagine that instead of ha having paper sheets, you have uh, geological layers, yeah? So in the case of flexural slip, so we are looking here at the process that accommodates the folding. What happens there if we were to look, how, how does the deformation happen, yeah? That's the idea. How does the deformation happen? So in, in this brittle uh, uh, situation, brittle case situation, you have, let's say, sedimentary layers. And when they get folded, the interfaces between the sedimentary layers, they become like fold surfaces, yeah? There is slip along the interface. So there is slip and uh, even silicon lines are being formed, yeah? as in the case of folds in these cases. So obviously flexural slip is um, a, a process that uh, is very easy to understand because we all played at some point or another in our lives with, you know, these, these things. Uh, now imagine wh when I said this is in the brittle regime, yeah, because in the brittle regime, you have uh, brittle deformation, yeah, slip along some surface. Now imagine that you are somewhere deeper in the crust and it's warmer. So maybe the deformation is not that localized. Yeah, instead of being localized along some surfaces, it is distributed, yeah? So if it is di distributed, then we call that flexural shear or flexural flow. So the result is the same, yeah? But in this case, in this case, uh, the deformation, as I said, is not just localized along some surfaces. It, it is distributed, yeah, it is distributed um, in the limbs of the fold. Um, and obviously this goes hand in hand with the plastic regime. Uh, and of course you would have more strain, more strain as you get away from the hinge. So here there will be more strain than here. Now, an experiment, obviously the same would, would happen here. An experiment that you can do is, again, draw some circles uh, on the side of a pile of papers, bend them and see what happens with the strain, how the strain is distributed. The, the circles will become ellipses, yeah? So that is the idea. You can actually play this and you can actually see very nicely what we have been discussing about the strain ellipse, uh, ellipsoid, yeah, and ellipse in a plane uh, from a circle. Just do this if you want to, <laughs> if you want to put uh, ink on the side of a pile of papers or of a book. All right, it has to, have to be a soft cover book. Yeah, not a hard cover. Um, all right, so these I think are pretty intuitive and easy to understand. Now, there is one more process here I wanted to show you. Um, no, before that, one slide. This is a summary, yeah? The summary of flexural slip versus flexural uh, shear. 
I think very intuitive. This is the experiment I was asking you to do to see uh, to see what happens. Uh, anyway, so one more um, process here, uh, which we call orthogonal flexure. Yeah. Now I want you to um, to look at you know at this this thing. There is a comparison between orthogonal flexure here and flexural flow. Yeah, or shear. So what happens if you look at the strain ellipses? Yeah, at the strain ellipses. This is exactly what I've shown you. Yeah, in the case in the case of the active folding. Yeah, so that is the idea. In the case of this active active folding, um, you have this deformation, which is extension here. Yeah, stretching. Yeah, and here you you see shortening and you see it in the stress ellipses here yeah how they are oriented now this is called orthogonal flexure because of a very interesting property it says all lines originally orthogonal to the layering remain orthogonal through the deformation uh, history so basically these are the lines orthogonal to the layering and you see when the deformation happens they are orthogonal here to the tangents yeah that's the idea whereas in this case in the case of flexural flow they are not you see the the distribution and the difference you can see the difference between this and this so i think that although it might seem to you um very how to put it end members yeah end members and I hope you understand this when we discuss the mechanisms and the processes and in general in geology, we try to simplify them to uh, to understand them at the mechanical level in terms of end members. Now, obviously, in reality, we encounter a whole sp spectrum of situations and many factors come into play. Yeah, many factors, not only the uh, uh, rheological composition, but also the temperature and so on. So the folds are very Im impressive in general. We are uh, all impressed by folds when we see them, um, but it's a field of study in itself. And there are people who specialize and write papers and very sophisticated papers on folds and so on. Um, I want you to have the basics. So what I'm asking you to do is reading this, it's not much. Uh, reading this as the required reading, yeah? I will test you on this for uh, in test three. But if you want, and if you are interested, you can read also in the other textbook, what they say, the same material, yeah? Uh, the same material, folds and folding. You can look at the at their diagrams to understand. Um, and um, you can read the rest of the chapter in, in, in this textbook if you are more interested in knowing more details about folding yeah so that's the idea uh, my approach was instead of uh, having very dense uh, 60 uh, slides uh, you know presentations and moving every five seconds and so on and at the end you would say wow it was like the train just passed <laughs> yeah i want you to have some very strong foundations upon which you can build in the future all right so this is the approach. Uh, this is the class for today. As I uh, promised you, um, it's shorter uh, to give you more time to do other things or to study structural geology. All right. So thank you very much for today. I'm going to stop this. If you have questions, please.